All right, here guys. What's up? How are we doing? Are you guys staying safe? We are here, we're still kicking. As you can see, we're gonna do our best to keep the content train coming to you guys. Everyone at Flight Test is safe. Here in Ohio, in the United States, we are all currently working from home. So, I can't build airplanes, I can't fly airplanes, but I can talk about airplanes. And so today, we are going to have a very special, a very different flavor episode, and we are gonna be talking about the most iconic, rugged backcountry stole war course of the sky, the de Havilland DHC-2 Beaver. Before we get started, I wanted to give a huge shout out to our sponsor for this video, and that is Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that you can use to make beautiful websites. So as you guys know, the Beaver has a very special place in our hearts, because most recently we came out with a brand new product, which is a micro RC Beaver that you can actually buy by checking out the link below, shameless plug. But beyond our involvement with the Beaver, the origins and the story of the Beaver are actually really, really interesting. So the origins of the Beaver started with a little company you might've heard of called De Havilland. Now, De Havilland originally was in the UK. They were known for some planes you may have heard of, like the Tiger Moth, which is an iconic trainer biplane, the Mosquito, the all wooden twin engine fighter that was fast enough to make the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. What? and other planes like the Comet, which was the world's first commercial jet airliner. Now, the interesting thing is that in 1928, De Havilland started a subsidi subsidiary, a subsidiary, subsidiary, subsidiary of the original De Havilland in the UK, hence the DHC-2 Beaver. Alan, Al, Alan. I never really actually put that together until right now, but the DHC, that's what it stands for, De Havilland Canada. So De Havilland Canada continued to kick out more awesome airplane designs. Once it was established in 1928, they made all kinds of really cool aircraft, such as the Chipmunk, which is a cute little trainer, the Caribou, which is a heavy lift cargo plane that really likes to drive around on one wheel, and the Otter, which is basically just a big beaver, and then the Twin Otter, which is a really, really huge beaver. <laughs> So, back to the beaver. The story of the beaver starts just after World War II. The war was over, which was good news, but what that meant for de Havilland is that there's no military contracts, which is bad. So, de Havilland went to work to develop new designs that would hopefully attract civilian operators. So, first things first, they hired a guy by the name of Punch Dickens. <laughs> I'm not joking, that's really his name. But he was a bush pilot pioneer, and he was also referred to by a lot of people as the Flying Knight of the Northland. <laughs> but anyways, he became the director of sales for de Havilland. So immediately, Punch Dickens got to work, and he talked to all of his pilot friends and took a ton of feedback from the civilian pilot community and decided that this new airplane that was going to attract the civilians had to have a couple things. One, it had to have stole performance. Now, if you don't know what STOL performance is, STOL stands for short takeoff and landing. Basically, these types of aircraft are able to get to places that are otherwise only reached by a boat or by foot. Beyond that, it also would have to have a ton of power so it could carry all of the cargo and carry out the tasks of these bush pilots. It was unanimously agreed on that all pilots are always wanting more power. <laughs> And these guys don't mess around. They're doing some crazy stuff in the backcountry. Things like putting your boat on a beaver. Some of them even fly the real beaver off the same runway that you fly your RC beaver off of. God. If you want to fly off of water, snow, runways, dirt, the Beaver had to be able to do it all. Next, it was very clear that the entire aircraft had to be constructed out of nothing but pure metal. So just like their Mosquito, de Havilland moves very, very quickly. And by August 16th of 1947, the first DHC-2 Beaver took to the sky. Shortly after that, in 1948, the first production aircraft was delivered. And at that time, they weren't the only ones trying to get this business. A little company by the name of Cessna came out with their Cessna 195, which was one of its main competitors at the time. And even though the 195 is a beautiful aircraft that is still loved by pilots to this day, it's no match for the power and the performance of a beaver, specifically if you're mainly interested in stole capabilities. <laughs> 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 
Now, at first, sales were not terrible, but they weren't great. Things were a little bit slow. They were selling some, but they, they weren't going like hotcakes. That all changed with the outbreak of the Korean War. Long story short, business picked up when the US Army ordered 970 beavers, which is more than half of the overall productions of all the beavers that were ever made. So now that there was about a thousand beavers flying out there, word started to spread a little bit faster about how amazing the beavers' capabilities were. That being said, more people started buying them abroad, and the beaver actually served in 30 different countries, and eventually, over time, they started to phase out. At this point, that was when beavers were converted to fulfill civilian roles. So as you guys can see, I'm down here in my basement on quarantine 2020, but that's not gonna stop me from working on my website here. And I wanna show you guys something, something you probably didn't know. So as you guys can see here, we use Squarespace and we have been using Squarespace for a long time to make our flightfest.com website. Now Squarespace, if you're not familiar, is an all-in-one platform that you can use to build beautiful websites. This was honestly just like a template that we kind of fine tweaked and added our own image. And it was super easy to do because it's all drag and drop. I do a lot of flight test print and web design, um, but I'm more of just an aesthetic guy. I'm not really much of a back end guy when it comes to coding and stuff like that. And the best thing about Squarespace is that doesn't matter because you don't need to worry about trying to figure out how to make it work. You basically just get to focus on how it functions and how it looks. You don't have to worry about the back end coding, which is really nice. So as you can see here, it integrates with other online platforms. Like for example, here we use Eventbrite to do all of the registration for FlightFest. And it is able to integrate right into the flightfest.com website without any problem. So, and the coolest thing too is look at this, it actually will adapt to whatever kind of device you're on. So, nice thing about Squarespace is you don't need to design two different sites for one for mobile, one for desktop, because the templates are automatically adaptive and they'll adapt depending on what screen resolution your device has. This means that more people are gonna be able to access your website anytime, anywhere. So, as you can see here, this is what it looks like when you log into Squarespace on the back end. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Now, this tab right here, the design tab, this is where I spend a lot of my time. And as you can see, um, you can go in here and there's all kinds of different templates that you can install. With basically a click of the button, I could pretty much change the entire look of my website and make it feel like a fresh new design, um, which is pretty nice. Beyond that, there's all kinds of different options in terms of e-commerce, marketing, scheduling, analytics. You can go in here and you can see the back end of all the different types of graphs and charts that you need to see of like what kind of traffic your website is getting. It really gives you an idea of who's visiting your website, which is pretty nice. Now, the best part about all of this is you can try out Squarespace right now. Just head over to squarespace.com and you can actually start a free trial. And beyond that, if you go to squarespace.com slash flight test, you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So again, huge shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. It's because of them and you guys out there watching that we're able to do what we do. So thank you so much. And let's get back to the beaver. Now, fast forward to the 1960s and de Havilland got real crazy with their beavers and they made what they called the Mark III Turbo Beaver. <laughs> And as you can see, it looks a little bit different. And that's because on the front, instead of the original radial, it had a Pratt & Whitney PT6 turboprop. Craziest thing about all this is they only made about 60 of them originally from the factory. And then in 1967, production of the Beaver eventually ceased, at which point the 1,657th Beaver rolled off the line and the Beavers have never been manufactured since. <laughs> But the good news is, is that airplanes tend to last a lot longer than traditional automobiles. When it came to the general characteristics of the Beaver, it could be flown by one person, a crew of one, which is pretty cool. But beyond that, it had a capacity of up to six passengers or 2,100 pounds. Now, in terms of an airplane, 2,100 pounds of a useful load is a lot. Now, when calculating your payload, you obviously have to consider things like fuel, but put it into perspective, that's like a full grown Clydesdale horse or a Mitsubishi Mirage, or if you're a real crazy backcountry bushman, you can strap your Yamaha Grizzly to the side of your pontoon and take it straight on up to the blue yonder. And if you're plane crazy, you can take your plane, put it on your plane, and you can plane fly your planes anywhere you want. The length of the aircraft was 30 feet and it had a whopping wingspan of 48 feet, which is pretty big for a high wing single engine aircraft. It was nine feet tall, so you had no problem walking right under that wing without having 
having to bend your head down. And it had a huge wing area of 250 square feet. Empty, the thing weighed about 3,000 pounds. And the gross max weight that you could get it up to is 5,100 pounds. In other words, that's an extremely capable aircraft. Now, the original Beavers were powered off of one Pratt & Whitney R985 Wasp Jr. radial engine. And beyond being really well known for their whopping 450 horsepower, they also are loved by many pilots just for their sound. Insert sound. <laughs> Problem was is that eventually the R985 Wasp Jr. was eventually out of production, so parts became hard to find. At this point, people started swapping out their engines for other more powerful options. The most desirable engine upgrades was the PT6 turboprop and also was the same engine that the Mark III Turbo Beaver had. Now the great thing about the PT6 is obviously it was more powerful, but at the same time it was also lighter. And so when you add those things together, you have a highly capable and versatile aircraft. Now the downside of doing an engine swap as always is it's expensive. Put it into perspective, the PT6 alone, just the engine itself is gonna cost you around three quarter million dollars, depending on which variant of the turboprop you get. The good news is, is even if you have the traditional Beaver with the Wasp Junior engine, you're still gonna be able to cruise at 143 mile an hour with a maximum speed of 158 miles an hour, which relatively compared to a lot of other planes, that isn't very fast. But keep in mind, the tasks that these airplanes were designed to carry out were previously being carried out by a sled dog team. So as long as it's faster than those traditional dog sled teams, it's gonna be fast enough. So 143 mile an hour cruise speed was a huge improvement compared to how they were doing it before. Beyond that, the Beaver could fly for about 455 miles on one tank of fuel, and it had a service ceiling of 18,000 feet. Couple that with a climb rate of 1,000 foot per minute, and you have an extremely versatile utility aircraft. Now, since its first flight in 1947, the Beaver has carried out all kinds of different operations. Things like search and rescue, which was heavily utilized by the Civil Air Patrol. Beyond that, you had the British across the pond and the Army Air Corps deployed their Beavers for photo recon missions, one of which was hit seven times by machine gun fire and still made it back. Sir Edmund Hillary, you know, the guy who was the first one to reach the top of Everest, he later led an expedition where he and his team completed the first overland crossing of Antarctica over the course of 1955 to 1958. This was made possible by the support of the Beaver. Even Harrison Ford, who is a very accomplished pilot and a big advocate of general aviation, owns and operates his own Beaver. The Beaver is one of his favorite planes, which he fell in love with after flying one in the critically acclaimed movie Six Days, Seven nights. Two strangers on a flight to Tahiti are about to make an unscheduled stop. Anyways, he's flown all kinds of amazing aircraft, including the Millennium Falcon, so if he says the Beaver is good, it must really be good. In recent years, there's been a growing interest in the leisure industry for the de Havilland Beaver. People are using them to go out and go fishing with their buddies or go hunting for some moose and some elk out on the open mountain range. It's also well loved for its skydiving and aerial film activities. Nowadays, a company called Viking Air owns all the patents and now services and produces parts for all the beavers and also offers new productions of the larger otter and twin otter, which are also amazing aircraft. In total, there were 1,657 beavers made up until 1967 and to this day there's still over 800 of them still in service still flying in the blue yonder and speaking of which you can actually still get one at the time of this recording there's actually two beavers for sale one of which is the traditional piston that you can get for a cool four hundred thousand dollars and if you want the turboprop version it's gonna set you back 1.6 million which sounds like a lot but when you think of the possibilities of all the different things that you could do with your own personal beaver it starts to add up and the turboprop one that's currently for sale it even comes with a set of amphibious floats that have retractable wheels so you can land on the water or on the concrete now if general aviation is a little bit too expensive for your taste i totally get it i can relate that's why i'm in my basement making airplane videos instead of out flying my own personal airplane but the good news is, is you can get the full taste of an aviation experience with the rc hobby and like i mentioned earlier we recently came out with our own micro rc beaver which is a blast but beyond that the de havilland beaver has been a staple in the rc hobby just as long as it's been around pretty much Ha <laughs> ha!
<laughs> and here at Flight Test, we do all kinds of aviation content, and we've actually had experiences with a couple iconic Beaver models, like the original Fly Zone Beaver, as well as the 2000 millimeter FMS Beaver, which we had a blast with. This thing is huge. On top of that, if you're new to the hobby, we teach people how to make airplanes out of common materials like foam board and barbecue skewers and hot glue, stuff that you can get from the dollar store and really go out there and experience flight for yourself. So if you wanna learn more about the RC hobby, definitely check out our channel. We're doing all kinds of RC aviation content all the time. Also, shout out to the guys and gals over at Donut Media. If you like this video and you like cars, definitely go check them out. They have the best car content on YouTube, and obviously they were a huge inspiration for this edition of our quarantine content. Anyways, guys, that's everything I know about the beaver. Let me know what you think about this video. Let me know if you like it, if you don't like it, if it could be better in certain ways. We're getting weird. I'm in my basement right now during the quarantine. I hope you guys are staying safe. Leave us a comment down below if you have any ideas what we should call these videos. Also, if there's any other kinds of projects you'd like to see us do during this quarantine. The good news is, is that both Josh and his son Noah are still gonna be able to create content at their house where they can also fly. So we're still gonna be having flying videos. We're gonna be doing videos from my basement. Thank you guys for making this possible. We wouldn't be here without you. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you do so, and we'll see you in the next one. Leave a comment. What should be the next plane?